It's about public access and equity. A member of Congress is calling on the president to increase access to public lands for all Angelinos. I'm Latanya Norton. That's coming up in this edition of A Royal Now. Now, I've been working for over 20 years on bringing resources to the San Gabriel Mountains. So you can imagine how thrilled I am to be here today to celebrate the reintroduction of our legislation and to officially announce our community's new campaign to permanently protect these mountains. That was a clip of Congresswoman Judy Chu recently at a press conference at Eaton Canyon Park announcing an effort to expand the San Gabriel Mountains uh, to all Angelinos. Hello, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Arroyo Now. I'm your host, Latanya Norton, and joining us to discuss this effort, we have the Congresswoman herself, Judy Chu, representing the 28th Congressional District. Thank you so much for being here. And we also have with us Daniel Rossman, who is the California Deputy Director of the Wilderness Society. Thank you both for being here to talk about this effort. We'll start with you, Congresswoman. Tell us about the Public Lands Act and what it does for us. The Public Lands Act contains my bill, the San Gabriel Mountains Protection Act, mm -hmm. and it would expand the borders of the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument to include the Western Angeles National Forest. And it would also designate 30,000 acres of protected wilderness and 45 miles of protected rivers here in Southern California that are emanating from and contained within this area. Uh, this is so important because we have 18 million people living within a 90 mile radius of the San Gabriels. And it is a 90 minute drive at most for anyone to come and enjoy nature, become mentally healthy and be able to uh, physically uh, get healthier uh, by hiking, fishing, uh, and doing a multitude of things that um, can be beneficial to them. Uh, it is the, the fact that uh, there's an Antiquities Act, which would allow the president to declare this national monument expansion. And so our um, bill memorializes that and urges him to do that. Now, this dates back to uh, 2014, I believe it was, when President Barack Obama did designate three-fourths of the San Gabriel Mountains as um, a national monument. But there's that one-fourth uh, we want to go back and try to attain. Is that correct? Yes, that is right. And Dan, if you would tell us exactly what area are we talking about? We know that this increases access for areas such as Silmar and Santa Clarita and Pacoima. Tell us exactly where we're talking about. It's that watershed area, correct? Yeah, essentially it's the LA River watershed or the view shed if you're looking from the San Fernando Valley or even, you know, I look out my back door in, in Pasadena and look up to the mountains. And, and what I see is sort of the front country just below the tip of Mount Wilson. Um, and all of that front range is included in this uh, proposed expansion to the National Monument. So this is over 100,000 acres that we are hoping to attain. You recently, a Congresswoman, wrote a letter to President Biden asking if he would expand this National Monument. How important is this to our community? Well, um, Los Angeles is considered one of the most part poorer areas uh, in the nation. And what we want to do is to increase access to nature. Actually, mm -hmm. it is something attainable. Uh, like I said, it's within a 90 mile, um, 90 minute uh, drive of anybody within LA County. But believe it or not, there are people in our, our areas, especially in low-income communities that have not gone up to the mountains. 
And I have heard many testimonials, in fact, from young people who said that when they went to the mountains, uh, it was so incredible. They'd not done it before and it changed their lives. So what we want to do is to make it more accessible. We want to make sure that all of the eligible land, which is the federal land up there, is indeed declared a monument so that it can get the resources that it needs. And not only does it get the resources that it needs, it gets the protection, right? Tell us more about the protection. What are we protecting it uh, from, if you will? Yes, uh, we would be able to ensure that um, uh, that the species that are up there uh, can be protected, like the big cone fir trees, uh, as well as the animals that are up there, like uh, the bighorn sheep. Uh, there will be more resources to be able to do that. But uh, what I look forward to most is making sure that the uh, place is kept up, that uh, we remove the graffiti, we remove the trash, that the trails are are improved and maintained to the highest degree possible, and that there is management up there. We saw that occur when President Obama declared it a national monument in 2014. So we did see some big improvements, but we want to make sure that this entire area is improved. Absolutely. And and we're talking about wildlife protection, water supply uh, protection, and you touched on trash, people gathering in the area, leaving trash. Tell us how this will be maintained. Well, with a manager, a forest um, supervisor manager, we would be having um, people looking out for this trash. And in fact, at one point in time, in order to stop the trash, they had rangers that were uh, up there uh, managing the situation so that uh, people would throw away the trash in the proper way. But due to budget cuts, that program stopped. I think we have to start it up again in the uh in the old boundaries in the area that was declared in 2014. But certainly this is an issue in this new area and we would be able to get the resources necessary to manage all of that. And I know we do have footage of this beautiful area. I think uh, Dan is going to kind of walk us through and let us see what we're looking at. But before we get to that footage, you, you mentioned Congresswoman that Los Angeles County is one of the most park poor uh, communities or areas of the country. I don't think many people realize that. A lot of people come here and they see the beautiful mountains and they see the great outdoors and everyone knows all the the wildlife and, and the natural resources. Park poor. That is if that people don't associate with Los Angeles County. Well, but we're a big urban area of uh, 18 million people. Mm -hmm. And there are those who um, are in some of these areas, don't have the resources to go up to the mountains. And um, even though it is within within a a, a 90 minute drive, they may not have those abilities to get up there. And they may not have had uh, a a family that would even know that that resource is there. So yeah, uh, that is something that uh, we are trying to remedy. Um, what we would hope is that they would actually have green spaces nearby them, uh, like within a mile radius. I know that's in my city, Monterey Park, we have uh, a park within a mile of every home. But not every community is like that. And so this provides an alternative. The mountains provides an escape hatch for all of those who would want to commune with nature. And how important is it to commune with nature, especially in these high density urban areas? Well, it's so essential for your mental health. It's a it's a way for people to let off steam, to be able to be in an area where you can breathe the clean air where you can splash in the river, uh, where you can uh, hike and, and let off uh, all, all that steam and all that energy that you might be accumulating. Um, I, I remember the testimonial 
of a veteran who had PTSD and in fact said he was suicidal until, until he started coming up to the San Gabriel Mountains. And it had such a healing effect on him that he started volunteering with uh, the groups up there and has been devoted to it ever since. I believe that. That's impressive. Wow, that's amazing. Daniel, if you would, we do have footage. If you can kind of uh, walk us through for those who may not have had the pleasure of going to the San Gabriel Mountains, please uh, just kind of give us a look and a, and a tour. That would be great. Yeah, the San Gabriels are an incredible place to, to visit with beautiful nature, uh, rushing waterfalls. And in this expansion area, you can see a couple of really well-known waterfalls like Switzer Falls that many people hike up to, um, Cascade down the rocks. Um, one of my favorite places is along Trail Canyon Trail. You get to a, a, a very large um, waterfall uh, and enjoy views of chaparral, this sort of thick brush that grows along the hillsides. Uh, this place is famous during the great hiking area atop Mount Low. Um, people historically, we used to have a, a funicular that took people up to the top of the the mountain, and you can actually see remnants of those old gears and um, this sort of idea that we're reconnecting people uh, to the mountains with some transited trail efforts, some of those that have been funded by Congresswoman Judy Chu's community partner grants. Um, this is really, we're seeing this sort of re-emergence of what was called the great hiking area in the early 1900s. Uh, we're seeing people, particularly after the pandemic, really getting out and enjoying these places like the Mount Low Summit, um, really appreciating the fact that a third of the county's drinking water comes off the Angeles National Forest. So along the Arroyo Seco River or um, the, the, the watershed that drains into the LA River, um, is really critical for providing clean drinking water for our communities. Wow, I love it. Congresswoman, tell us about the Transit to Trail program, which is essentially connecting people to nature who may not have access. Well, thank you for allowing me to talk about it. Yeah, uh, you know, we have far too many cars up there in the San Gabriel Mountains. And one way to decrease the amount of cars that go up there is to have this transit to trails program. But what is even more exciting is somebody that would not otherwise have access could just go on our metro lines like the Gold Line, which uh, has a station here in Pasadena. And they could just go from the Gold Line to this transit to trails program, uh, which would have five stops along the San Gabriel Mountains route and ending at the Mount Wilson Observatory, which uh, has all these programs um, that uh, would be very exciting for people to experience it. So um, I provided uh, 1.75 million uh, through community project funding from the federal government to get this program going. And I hope that it can be a permanent program. Absolutely. Wow. This is great. And so I know that with this effort, you teamed up with Senator Padilla um, for this. How did this partnership come about? It is always great to have a Senate version of whatever bill you have, because then there is a greater chance for success. And I started with uh, Senator, then Senator Kamala Harris, uh, who was very enthusiastic about this. But when Senator Padilla was appointed in her place, he just embraced it. And he's he's embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, uh, so, yeah, we have been partners in this whole process. Uh, we started with uh, a bill on a developing this area as a national recreation area, which would put it under the Park Service. But then this exciting opportunity came to expand the monument. And the thing is that would make it so successful is that this is totally under the president's control. We don't have to go through the process of votes through Congress. Because of the Antiquities Act, uh, President Biden can do it all himself. And it is important to note that President Biden did pledge that uh, to have 30% of land and waterways protected by 2030. Yes, 
He wants to make sure that we protect the beautiful natural resources of this country. And so, yeah, he's been steadily declaring these uh, monuments. And uh, we just really hope that he will do this one and that he himself can come. That It would be so exciting to see him right here in these mountains, enjoying what we know is such a national treasure. Absolutely. And the president also wants to ensure that the community uh, is supportive of this, right? That's right. Um, he wants to make sure that uh, the community is uh, enthusiastic about this. So that's why we have embarked on uh, a, a project of, of going to all the important stakeholders and making sure that they send letters uh, saying that this is exactly what they want. We already know that this is what they want because there's been um, for a couple of decades, studies on what um, they want with the San Gabriel Mountains. They want more resources up there. And the first time the study was done, 12,000 people submitted comments about wanting more resources. So we know that that um, uh, many are uh, wanting to get more resources uh, and even more attention paid to these mountains. So um, we've gotten uh, resolutions most recently by the LA County Board of Supervisors and then by the city of Pasadena and, and numerous other entities. And for the most part, there has been an overwhelmingly, an overwhelming amount of support, but there has been some pushback, right, Daniel? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of the things that is uh, surprising. There's, there's really not a lot of pushback. I expected that there would be some sort of ideological resistance. Um, you know, sometimes people, you know, just are a little wary. But I think once you take the time to explain, these are already lands that are owned by the federal government. And this is really just ensuring that the direction for managing those places are such that preserve them for recreational opportunity, for water quality, for species protection, for future generations. And so, um, there's been very little uh, organized opposition to speak of. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I know that back at that time in 2014, uh, when this area was designated uh, by President Barack Obama, he did say that it's not enough to have this place protected, but this is an issue of environmental justice. People need to be able to access these lands. Your reaction to that comment, Congresswoman? Yes, absolutely. I was so glad that he was uh, so adamant about the protection of these lands for the people of this area. And let me just say a little bit more about what happened in 2014 versus now. In 2014, there were some people who were naysayers, and these were those who were afraid of what it would mean to have this declared a national monument. Uh, they said, oh, they'll seize your land. They'll uh, prevent you from hiking and fishing um, and uh, uh, that uh, they'll they'll close down certain things that you enjoy right now. Well, all of that turned out not to be true. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we started a community collaborative of all the stakeholders, uh, even those who were naysayers at first. And this community collaborative has been incredible. Um, they have worked together so well that uh, now they the ones that were naysayers are our supporters. So this time around, it has been so much better because uh, everybody could see that um, disaster did not happen. And in fact, the opposite occurred, which is that we did get more resources for the mountains. And what will change with these additional resources? Well, um, you need management. You need people who will um, direct the volunteers, who will direct the certain projects that need to be done. And um, uh, and in fact, I was just uh, talking to uh, people up there. You know, there are discretionary funds uh, in the Forest Service, and, and they were just... Uh, directing someone to do some trail improvements uh, up that by my next question. Yeah, Crystal Park, uh, Crystal Lake, I should say. Um, and uh, they 
uh, and in fact, they are embarking on on this uh, improvement up there, uh, oh, and of the visitor center up by Crystal Lake. So, um, yeah, that that is the thing. There needs to be people who can manage the area, and that's what this monument designation has given us. Absolutely. And so, with the recent rains, this act will insist in trail restoration. Absolutely. And um, in fact, uh, we will be able to get better protection for the maintenance of mm -hmm. these areas. Uh, and in fact, with the infrastructure bill, uh, I am very proud to say that we will have better protection against potential wildfires as well. There's uh, a billion dollars there for that kind of uh, maintenance and protection. And also uh, there is a problem with uh, pay of, of uh, firefight our federal firefighters. So it, there's an improvement in terms of the pay for them. And then there's a wilderness uh, uh, firefighting uh, committee that is to oversee the efforts to protect our lands from wildfires. And when you talk about the San Gabriel Mountains, and I know Congresswoman, your time is precious. You don't, we don't have you for the full hour. Um, but I do want to get this in. This is about future generations. As we speak, there aren't plans that we know of that consist of mining or construction or that sort of thing. But we want to make sure that as the administrations change or as time goes on, that this area is protected for future generations and expanded. Yes. Well, once it's a monument, yeah. Nobody can take it away or would dare to take it away, I would say. Uh, and in fact, once it's a monument, then it gets on a national map of monuments. There are those that, that I run into who say they have just made it their bucket list to go to every monument <laughs> that there is in America. So, yeah, it this is something that will last forever and that will benefit our area for sure forever. What do you want people to do? So I really hope that they can send in their comments of support. Uh, we have a uh, website, the San Gabriel Mountains Forever website, and you can uh, go on to uh, the section which shows you how to give your input about this particular proposal. And you know what, Congresswoman, I would love to hear from you. What is your fondest memory of the San Gabriel Mountains? Why did you choose this? Why is it so important to you? Well, uh, I've had so many adventures up there and they've been so delightful. Um, I'll never forget when the uh, Fly Fishing Association decided they had to take me to go fly fishing. You know, I'd never done fly fishing in all my life, but uh, I decided to be out there in the stream and and throw that hook out. And it was so much fun. Wow. So memories like that, you know, just being there, doing something that perhaps you never expected to do. But being there with nature is just such a great memory. And to think family experiences to, you know, those of us who have families, you, we're always looking at things to do, different things to do that maybe doesn't involve technology all the time. It's just wow. a great um, option to have. Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, we see all kinds of groups up there, church groups, uh, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, all kinds of uh, families that come up there to celebrate uh, some some uh, special event. Uh, there are so many reasons for uh, groupings to come up there and individuals who want to just do in their own individual hike. All right. Well, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. Anything to say in closing? Maybe you there's something that I didn't ask that you had hoped I'd ask. Well, I would just uh, urge you to go on to the San Gabriel Mountains Forever site. Look at the map that is there, which shows the boundaries of this proposed area. And then uh, sign on to some letter. And you know what? Uh, in that letter, express some kind of experience that you've had with the San Gabriel Mountains. Talking from your personal viewpoint is just really powerful. San Gabriel Mountains Forever.org. 
Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman, for um, taking the time to be a part of our program. Thank you so much for being here and, and just sharing the insight. Thank you for the work you're doing. And we should also note that there's really not a time frame uh, per se for this, but, but obviously uh, the sooner the better um, that you get those letters in and get, and get that feedback to the White House, correct? Absolutely. As soon as possible. <laughs> Sounds great. Daniel Rossman, thank you so much for staying with us. As landscape director, what can be done uh, by the average person who goes to visit uh, this beautiful treasure that we have in our own backyard when people are visiting the San Gabriel Mountains? Uh, what can be done uh, to assist with the fruition of this effort? The Congresswoman had it exactly right. Adding your voice to the call to protect this area is critically important. The Biden administration you know, has a many, many competing priorities. And the more we can demonstrate that there's this groundswell of local support, the better our chances of getting on that very competitive agenda uh, and getting this, this place designated uh, for future generations. So uh, partners like Nature for All have helped establish a website where folks can go it, at sangabrilmountainsforever.org. Uh, you can go to that website and click on Take Action, and there you'll have an opportunity to, to write a letter, and we'll make sure that the, the presidents uh, and our champions like Congresswoman Judy Chu and Senator Padilla see, see those letters. All right. And I, I saw where I think you were quoted as um, giving out numbers in terms of the amount of visitation to this area, which is astounding. The Angeles National Forest gets 4.6 million visitors a year, more than the Grand Canyon, more than the Grand Canyon, just let that sit in for a second, and Yosemite National Park. That's amazing. It, it is really incredible. The, the Forest Service recently redid its um, survey uh, looking at those visitation numbers. And for those of us who um, have the opportunity to, to visit those places um, often. It's it's not too much of a surprise for, for why so many people are enjoying the opportunity to get there. I think some of those numbers have increased because of COVID across the country. We've seen people really appreciate the opportunity to get outside, get in nature and have that rejuvenating effect. And I think that those numbers will continue to, to remain high with so many people living so close to uh, what is our, our urban backyard. It's it's just an incredible opportunity to escape. And I often think about it like the closet in Narnia. You just sort of go through the first you know half mile of uh, road, and all of a sudden you're you're back in remote nature. And it's very hard to believe that there are so many people uh, just a short drive away. And when you talk about the 4.6 million people a year that are already visiting. This is before we increase the access. Well, I think what's important to think about is how do we ensure that access is equitable so that all people have the opportunity? So it's not necessarily about just increasing the raw numbers, but there's also this really great education opportunity. When you think about something like transit to trails, you've got an audience captive on a bus. Let's play some videos and educating people about how to leave no trace, um, ensuring that people understand the value of these places so that um, we're not only thinking about how do we, um, you know, increase access for communities that don't have it, but ensuring that that access comes along with education, interpretation, so that our visitors are respecting and, and giving reverence to this place that um, has, has been here since time immemorial. Absolutely. And, you know, I can't help but think about the beauty of the San Gabriel Mountains and the, you know, increasing this access, what it will do to millions of Angelinos. Just tell me a little bit more about that. You know, I think one, I've, I've been uh, with the Wilderness Society for, for 15 years now and, and working uh, to protect the San Gabriels as well as other places in Southern California. But um, for me, you know, I think about that first experience one with my son on paternity lead. I had him on the that backpack carrying him around and uh, just exploring nature. We went uh, up Eaton Canyon many, many days. And 
I remember one one moment where uh, we spotted a woodpecker and we were observing the woodpecker. And just a couple of days later, someone had uh, come to my house and, and knocked on the door and he heard that knock, 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 knock. He goes, woodpecker. <laughs> and so there's a kind of connections that happen in uh, a young kid's life that are that are so amazing. And I've had the opportunity to go out um, with uh, immigrant communities who feel reconnected to, you know, the mountains that they visited in their home of Durango, Mexico, or people that are, you know, a little bit nervous on that start of that hike, you know, they're, they're worried about theirs, and they start to loosen up, and then you see their faces just explode with joy um, as they, you know, leap across a stream or, you know, find the cool shade of a oak tree, and, you know, it's those experiences that at an individual level are so transformational. Um, it's so important for groups like uh, the Wilderness Society, the Sierra Club, um, many others who are involved in uh, supporting this effort to really ensure that people have that place to connect to nature because we need advocates for nature. And the best advocate for nature is that experience, getting out there and really, um, you know, feeling the, the soil beneath your feet smelling the the pines that are uh you know dotting the landscape in the northern slopes of the San Gabriels uh feeling the the sun at your back as you summit a peak all of those experiences are so transformational that they really create advocates for nature for for the rest of their lives wow you mentioned that this has been a 15 year journey for you that's a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you haven't given up why? Yeah, it why? is. I mean, I know it's so important, but how has this journey been for you? So, I mean, on a, a personal level, I feel incredibly privileged to do yeah. this work. Um, I really uh, cherish those moments where I get to go out on a hike and, and show people this incredible place that we're working to protect. Uh, that's when I, I get to do the job that my mom thinks that I do when I say I work for the Wilderness Society. It's m more often a conference call or, you know, doing yeah. work to um, educate people or get get support for the effort. Um, but the other really rewarding thing is that I get to work with so many people who are uh, so passionate about protecting this place. I mentioned uh, Nature for All, a nonprofit that's really grown out of this effort. It started as a coalition to protect the San Gabriels and has formed its own 501c3 nonprofit and is doing work to champion further protections, but also connecting people to nature and advocating for things like transit to trails. Um, groups uh, like the Council of Mexican Federation that work with immigrant communities around LA County and Southern California who are bringing people to the mountains to experience nature for the first time. Uh, the uh, API, uh, API Forward Movement, engaging uh, Asian American communities or uh, groups like um, uh, Cal Wild or the Sierra Club that are traditional conservation groups. This really incredibly diverse coalition has come together with national, state, and local groups to um, help engage community in strengthening that voice for protecting this really special place. And it's also about environmental education too, because not only are you increasing access uh, to these areas, I love the, um, you know, the efforts to do that, but, you know, it, education, uh, letting people know, you know, exactly where they are, what's around them, why it's important, um, that that goes a long way. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, not only important, but one of the most effective tools we have at um, addressing some of those challenges like like trash or graffiti. Um, one program that I'm excited about relaunching uh, is done in partnership now with the Forest Service, but also the National Forest Foundation, Hispanic Access Foundation have teamed up uh, to hire uh, young uh, people to go out and engage people in some of the most visited places in the forest. and. We've seen that these programs that, you know, have people go out, you know, not in a, a, a uniform and a badge can sometimes be intimidating for, for visitors, but, you know, just a, a, a polo shirt and a smile and talking to people about, hey, um, you know, you may not know this, but there's a 
fish called the San Ana sucker that swims in the East Fork of the San Gabriel River. It's really important that we don't leave any trash or dam the river because uh, that can change the flow of water and really impact this uh, endangered species or um, letting people know about you know how long does trash take to decompose or even some simple things like how to use the um, the bear proof trash cans. You gotta slide your mm -hmm. hand through a little slot and <laughs> lift it up. And sometimes it's just that little bit of education that helps people uh, get over that hump and uh, becoming better stewards for the environment. It's funny you should mention that. I, I went on a trip. I was in um, Lake Tahoe for the 4th of July and I saw all of these bear proof trash cans and I didn't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it's it's important to to do that. What would you say to people who are on the fence about this? Um, you know, there are people who may say, yeah, it sounds OK, but I don't know if this is a priority. What would you say to that person? You know, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, if you haven't been up there, let me, let me take you up there and see it, because that's the best way to, to know this is a place worth protecting. Um, the two two big things that I think are really important to think about. One is just the um, the effort to ensure that the place is protected for future generations uh, is an international one. Scientists say that we need to protect 30% of lands and waters by the year 2030 to ensure that the worst impacts of climate change don't result in a mass species extinction. And the Southern California mountains are part of uh, the California floristic province, one of the most biologically diverse regions in the world. Um, and so it's critically important that we protect this place to ensure, you know, there's no new gravel mining or any kind of extractive use that, that happens there. And this designation uh, would ensure that. The second piece is, is one that will take a, a longer time horizon. It's, a, it's the audacity to think, you know, not just a couple of years ahead, but five, 10, 50 years into the future. Over time, uh, with monument designations, we have seen increased resources um, to do things like manage for recreation, um, ensuring that people have that education and uh, that the recreation is sustainable for future generations, which is so important for LA County, where, you know, 70% of the county's open space is in the Angeles National Forest. And so we need all the effort we can um, even even just a, a a little notch up is an incredible uh, benefit to millions of people. Seventy percent. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, we'd love to see a world in which that number changes because we're building more and more parks in urban communities, particularly. Um, and there are efforts like Measure A to to try to create more park space um, in communities in the. the in urban uh, neighborhoods and park poor communities in particular, but it's never gonna be less than the overwhelming majority of the open space for our county. And so ensuring that people have a sustainable way to, to recreate in those mountains is really important. What is the biggest misnomer when it comes to uh, this effort to expand the monument? I think um, it admittedly gets a little bit wonky when you start thinking about, OK, there's some different levels of government here and there's different uh, bills and actions by the president. So just to walk through that again, um, right now, this area is part of the Angeles National Forest. So it is federally owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Right. Monument status is an additional layer of protection for for federal lands that ensure no new mining and a focus on management as described in the, the monument proclamation, particularly to protect the objects uh, that are defined uh, in the in the actual act itself. So there's been an effort to expand this monument through legislation that would require uh, both the House and Senate to take action and the signature of the president. Uh, this call on the president to use the Antiquities Act is actually authority that was given to the president in the early 1900s. Um, the Antiquities Act said, OK, there are some places that are so important to protect that we don't want to wait for the slow turn of Congress. We want to give the president the ability to protect it right away. Uh, and so um, having seen legislation you know, move through the House and actually pass the House on, on multiple occasions, but not make it through the Senate and just that sort of 
hustle of uh, Congress, uh, particularly in the modern era, uh, is is something we don't want to wait for. We want to ensure that the president can take action today and preserve these areas for future generations. And so with his authority under the Antiquities Act, we're calling on President Biden to expand the National Monument by those additional 109,000 acres. Let's talk a little bit about wildfires or things of that sort. Is there a provision for tree replacement, foliage? Yeah, so the a couple of things that are important to know about fire management. One is um, this, this monument designation would not prohibit in any kind of uh, management activities for, uh, you know, fighting fires, particularly in the case of emergency. Um, and we're also hoping that the raising the level of the importance of this place helps ensure that there are the adequate resources to continue to manage fire uh, for future generations. In the latest um, infrastructure bill, we have seen an increase in funding for, for, for fire and the Southern California mountains have been designated as a priority uh, landscape. So there are new resources to um, ensure that uh, the appropriate fuel treatment is done in the right places to protect life and, and property. And that is so very important. And so we have talked about the historical significance, the scientific uh, concerns regarding this area. I think that's so important to, you know, to bring up because a lot of people may not have known about that. Uh, what else about this area is there that people may not be aware of? You know, one thing that I think is important to recognize is that these lands have been stewarded since time immemorial by indigenous communities. Um, the uh, Gabrielino Tongva, Keech peoples, Tataviam, many indigenous communities really, and particularly this monument expansion was uh, a network of trade routes for Native American peoples who, um, you know, called many of these places home, um, used trails like the Gabrielino Trail, which goes through the heart of the monument expansion um, to connect and trade with other tribes of the region. Uh, and so this, this act would also direct resources to ensure that um, cultural artifacts are preserved um, for future generations. And we wanna ensure that, you know, even today continued cultural um, uses like maybe harvesting um, acorns that are endemic to Southern California or um, other species that are important um, are, are able to continue to be collected and harvested for, for cultural uses. Is it easier? I don't I hate to use the word easier because I don't want to, you know, put that word out there. But do you think it's more likely that this expansion will take place uh, specifically because there's already been uh, a declaration, a designation, three fourths? Do you think that this last uh, 100,000 plus acres would be more likely to become um, part of this national monument? I think, you know, the big advantage that we see with that is really just uh, the impact it's had on the community. I mean, the Congresswoman talked a little bit about some resistance in 2014. And I think really um, the demonstration of what the monument has meant has really helped us increase the support for expansion this this time around. Um, it takes the same amount of, of work to, to add new acreage to the monument as it would be to, you know, designate it on it on its own. Um, but my hope is that with um, demonstration of, of local support, folks going on San Gabriel Mountains Forever.org and adding their, their name to the list on the Take Action page um, will help us build the momentum for that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would definitely hesitate to, to use the word easy. It's going to take a lot. And I think... Forget it, I even said that. <laughs> it is about, you know, I think... I have heard that though. So some people say, oh, this is this makes so much sense. It's a slam dunk. I mean, it's easy to sort of sit back and say this is this is done. But I think what's really important to realize is that it's not just whether or not this place is 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 worthy of this designation, but it's 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 about getting on a very um busy guy's to-do list. <laughs> the president of the United States has a lot sure. of competing priorities. And so when you look at that broad context of you know all the things that are happening globally and nationally that um, you know, are demanding attention of, of the president, it really is going to take 
uh, you know, us uh, collectively using our voices to make sure that we're, we're put at the top of that list. And you get the president's attention by making your voice heard, um, by writing those letters. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But also, I want to talk about the feedback and the and the feedback from the community that reaction to this effort pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, because I know that there was a big shift, correct? Yeah, I mean, we saw this nationally, if not globally, this this really resurgence of appreciation for nature. So many of us shared this experience of being stuck at home, not having, uh, you know, (laughs) enough daylight and we couldn't go many places. And the outdoors was one of the few places where we could go out safely. And in that experience, you know, like I said, being in nature is the best advocate for nature because so many people experienced or re-experienced this, this opportunity to connect to nature. And I, I truly believe that there's just something fundamentally human about that experience in nature. Um, the, there are many authors who've written about um, the, the benefits of nature, uh, you know, going back to Richard Louvre, who coined this term nature deficit disorder, uh, talking about the need to get particularly young people outdoors and uh, what that does for, for mental health, um, what it does for stress levels, for your ability to even concentrate. So these things that seem, you know, sometimes disconnected between, you know, this idea of just getting outside and playing, but it actually helps you concentrate more at work or on your homework. Um the benefits are really um, many and, and more and more research is coming out about um, the, those health benefits and those mental health benefits of, of being in nature. And the COVID pandemic, I think, made that not just a, a study in some academic journal, but a real personal experience for, for millions of people. Being out in nature, breathing in the fresh air, seeing you know, just seeing nature, butterflies or just whatever, hearing the birds, um, it just makes a big difference. And it's something that we can take for granted. You drive by it all the time. You see the beautiful mountains, but stop, get out, explore, be safe, of course, but just take it all in. Yeah, I, I definitely encourage any, anyone who has, has the time um, or inclination to to get out there and and take a friend who's who's never been. Uh, it is a really uh, enjoyable experience to see uh, someone experience nature for the first time. Uh, there are many nonprofits that are doing that kind of work. Um, Outward Bound Adventures, great one here in Pasadena, uh, that ensures that people have the experience and the tools and, and knowledge to really um, not only. Uh, you know, get out in nature, but thrive in nature and, and become leaders through that experience in nature. It's such a transformational experience for so many uh, people uh, that, yeah, we want to ensure we have this wonderful place to do that for future generations. And one more time, if you would touch on the wildlife uh, that you can only see in this area that, you know, if you're out and about or that uh, that's the natural habitat, touch on the wildlife. Yeah, for uh, habitat, this place is so incredibly important. It's one of the most biologically diverse regions in the world. Um, here you will see um, endangered species like the Santa Ana sucker swimming through our streams. Uh, there's iconic uh, bighorn sheep that travel throughout the San Gabriel Range. Wow. Uh, you know, I say those are the real LA Rams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's that. Plant life uh, like big cone firs uh, that you know have these giant pine cones that you only see here um, in in Southern California, mm-hmm. uh, and you know the mountains are dominated by this chaparral ecosystem that uh, is made up of you know ceanothus and these these large shrubby um, plants. You know John Muir famous uh, famously founded the Sierra Club. No hiking, sl- no hiking slouch described these as one of the most um, rugged and difficult mountains to, to hike through because of that, that very thick brush. Um, if you travel on, on well-paved trails, it's not too much of a problem, but um, you'll experience the, 
Um, you know, particularly after these recent rains, you could go out and see many wildflowers, the, the yucca, those spiky plants, you know, shoot up a stalk every 20 years. This is how they, they reproduce. They shoot a, you know, 20 foot, 25 foot tall stalk. It has these beautiful yellow flowers. It's sometimes referred to as Our Lord's Candle because it looks like a candelabra with all these little yellow buds. Um, and then uh, you you just get to experience these, you know, many wonderful smells of, you know, sage, of uh, the the pine trees. Uh, it's it's a full sensory experience when you get out uh, in nature and get to see the the, the birds, hear them chirping, um, or smell the smells, or, you know, hear the trickle of the water. That's amazing. And I, I was looking in my notes, I thought I wrote it down, but I couldn't find it. But I, I think there's a certain kind of fox that's in the San Gabriel's. I'm not sure, but I think I wrote it down and I can't find it. So don't worry about it. Yeah. I think there was a certain, I read somewhere. But at any rate, there are, it's just amazing what you'll see, what you'll discover. And uh, it's in our own backyard. It's a it's a treasure that we need to protect. So before we leave, is there any closing words? We're going to let people know that what they need to do to get more information uh, and definitely get those letters in. But before, before we let you go, any last comments about this? You know, I, I would just encourage people to to join this this movement of groups like Nature for All, uh, the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society. Uh, we've we've got groups like Active San Gabriel Valley, uh, API Forward Movement, um, Council of Mexican Federations, many other groups all coming together to advocate for the protection of this really important place. And you can join that effort by going to SanGabrielMountainsForever.org. You can take action, uh, ensure that your voice is added to the call of folks asking President Biden to use his authority to expand the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. SanGabrielMountainsForever.org. Once again, San Gabriel Mountains Forever org. Go on and let your voice be heard. Uh, Congresswoman Chu said to perhaps even share a personal experience that you've had uh, in this area. That's so important to pass along those memories, to share, to just let people know, let people in Washington know that this is uh, a treasure that I'd like to protect in my community. Thank you so much. Daniel Roth, he is the Deputy Director of the Wilderness Society. Thank you so much for being here and sharing this effort. Once again, an effort to expand the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. And right now the monument is 300,000, what's, what's the number? It's approximately 349,000 acres. And this expansion would add another over 109,000 acres. Wow, all right, sounds great. Daniel Rossman, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for having me.